students, <laughs> which is kind of exciting. Um, cool. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Um, on behalf of EdTech Women, um, welcome to tonight's discussion. It is an intimate affair, which <laughs> we're excited about. Um, my name is Mariel Reed, and together with Rachel, um, we co-organize uh, this series. Um, we are a group of now over 600 um, members in the Bay Area that convene. Um, we try to get together at least once a month on um, various topics, and um, those topics are typically generated in terms of content from the interests of our members. Um, so this one selfishly was my own interest um, <laughs> after reading uh, a report that Amber helped to author, which you'll hear about. Um, I was really curious about um, the space. So we're really excited um, to have assembled such a, an awesome group of people who um, come at this kind of uh, financing question from a variety of angles and experiences. Um, and I will let them introduce themselves. OK, um, so I guess I'm going to start. Uh, my name is Sylvain Kalash, and um, welcome um, to Holberton School, uh, which we are very happy to host this event today. Um, so a bit about the school, uh, we are a two-year alternative to college. Um, so not a boot camp, uh, but we are training software engineers uh, using a project-based and uh, peer learning approach, meaning that we have no formal teachers and no lecture, and students learn by basically practicing, working on projects, and collaborating with, with uh, their peers. Um, so a bit about my, uh, myself, uh, how I, I, I got into education. Um, I studied my master in software engineering in France. I, you, you might be able to tell Then I moved to China. <laughs> And then I finished my master here um, in partnership with Domin Dominican University. I got an internship at SlideShare. We've been uh, the software engineer, been acquired by LinkedIn, uh, where I worked for three years. And um, during all, th all this year in the Valley, um, I was constantly interviewing software engineers, and a lot of them were out of college. And they were with a lot of depth. And I was interviewing them, and I saw that they, they were smart. They, they got something, but they, they were not ready to take on a job. And uh, in France, we have um, like this school, actually now there are more schools, using this methodology without formal teacher, without lecture, a project based. That's now training half of software engineers in France. And there is a lot of software engineers who are working in the Silicon Valley world, doing amazingly, we have a great reputation. And with the student debt rising, we're like, yeah, there is something to do. So my co-founder, Julian Barbier, who was head of marketing at, at Docker at the time, and I decided to quit our job and, and start the school. And yeah, that's, that's where I am today. Hi, everyone. I'm Amber Laxton. I, am, um, I work for Entangled Solutions. And as Marielle mentioned, we um, authored a report last month about um, the future of financial aid, um, in which case a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion came up about ISA agreements for, um, for all types of education programs, not just non-traditional education programs. Um, I think that they're traditionally more popular in. Um, Entangled Solutions is a, it's a consulting company um, that's a little different than most of your other consulting companies. Uh, it's really made up of a bunch of builders and movers, ed tech startup um, entrepreneurs, and um, most people have not come from the consulting background, but from actually experience um, in the field. And, you know, um, really trying to make big movements happen um, in education. I got interested in education a um, while back, um, in continuing education in particular, in adult education. Um, so about 10, 15 years ago, uh, I was working for uh, DePaul University in Chicago, and um, we, we were part of the continuing education unit, and we had um, a lot of certifications and certificate programs for adult students. And at that time, it was really unpopular. Um, and it was actually really hard to pay for. Uh, financial aid doesn't cover it. Hard to get a loan for it. Not really even sure if you want to get a loan for it. Um, and so when I got the opportunity um, to really think about what the future of financial aid looks like while I've been at Entangled Solutions, um, it seemed only right to really explore ISAs in a lot of detail. Um, and if you have an opportunity to read the report, it does a really deep dive, I think, into kind of what this whole landscape looks like, but also what um, opportunities and what kinds of things need to happen in order for ISAs to really become a part of the education ecosystem. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those, but for those that may not know, what is an ISA? 
Uh, an income share agreement. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. Cool. We'll get into that shortly. <laughs> Cool. I'm Jesse. I work at Six Up PBC. Um, we're a seed stage company that does alternative financing for college, and we focus specifically on um, a loan designed for Pell grantees or low income students. Um, the main things that are different about our financing and our loan um, is one, we don't rely on entirely on credit score or cosigner in order to um, fund a student. Instead, we look at a lot of other factors that we think will be predictive of their success. We want to identify um, what we think could be like future prime customers, people that um, people that don't have a credit history to back them up, don't have parents with a credit history to vouch for them either, but but show have all the indicators of long-term success if given the right capital to get a four-year college degree. So right now, we only fund four-year four college degrees. Um, so this is year two of operating. So this summer is our second summer lending. So as you might imagine, it's really crazy, um, but, but really exciting. Um, in addition to the alternative underwriting, the other main difference with um, the six up loan is we provide wraparound services and support. So we're not um, money and then hands off it for five years until you have to pay us back. We uh, wanna have a very, uh, we want to have a very hands-on interaction with our students as they go through college with the main goals of helping them graduate with from school, get job placements, and know how to repay something like a loan. So um, that's actually uh, why I went on board with 6UP, and it's now just a piece of what I do, but to create all of those wraparound services, whether they're things we develop ourselves or things we white label or simply com completely outsource to other organizations, including things like internship matching, job placement, um, financial literacy, et cetera. Um, I joined Six Up last June, so right when we were op start, went, right when the loan was launching, um, and I came most recently from IDO.org, where I worked with our financial services for low-income populations, and I was really excited to enter Six Up. Um, just because there's so much opportunity for design in finances, financial services were all, all established for people with wealth originally and have kind of been retrofitted to different populations, both in the United States and abroad. And very little creativity has gone into how those how financial systems should look for people that don't have the same you know traditional wealth structures that, that others have. Um, and so I was really excited to. Uh, to, to do that domestically in the United States with, with college education in particular. Before idea.org, I had done digital inclusion work and, and research and evaluation with, um, with the Wikimedia Foundation, the group running Wikipedia, and then education consulting and other strategy consulting before that. So um, Six Up's been a fun combination of education, finance, and, and certainly program launching creative problem solving for me. Hi, I'm Casey Jennings, one of the founders of a firm called 13th Avenue Funding, which just shows we suck at marketing. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, one of our founders lives on 13th Avenue in Sacramento. So when the lawyer said, what's the name of this thing? We were like, um, Ed, where do you live? That's how it got named. So <laughs> we've been told we suck at marketing. Um, we started eight years ago, which also shows we suck at other things. Um, we started out as an ISA platform, but where that really came from so I'm a Bay Area native. My oldest brother used to run the Cal State Northridge Business School and the Econ Department for like the last 30 years. And when I got done spending about 25 or 30 years in corporate finance for places like GE Capital and Bank of America, which used to be here in town, and Bank of Tokyo, um, I called him up and said, what should I look at next? And he said, look at how we fund education, especially college. And then he hung up on me. <laughs> My older brothers do that, even when they're like 70. So. Um, I started to dig into that and found that the world had changed an enormous amount from sort of the year 2000 to when we started looking at 2009. In that, once you had the financial crisis and the state stopped funding colleges to the greatest extent, suddenly this gap opened up. And everybody in education pretended like this gap wasn't opening up. They looked at it and acted like, Oh, yeah, yeah, it's the same. And we still talk to lots of people all year long. And we still get the same answer of, from the stupid end of the spectrum, oh, they should work their way through college. OK. Or they should just borrow. And then you tell them, so the students from low income, low wealth backgrounds, you're asking them to borrow. And not, we're not talking about the 100K numbers. We're talking about sort of 15 to 25K. You're asking them to borrow three to five times their family's net worth. 
and the first response you get is, oh, that can't be right. And then the next response you get is, um, well, that's not my problem. And we've been hearing that for a long time. So that's how I got into this. Is it seemed like a big, thorny, ugly issue that people were ignoring. So that tends to appeal to me a lot. <laughs> and clearly for eight years, and we are at 501c3, we're a not-for-profit. So this has clearly been a labor of love. And as I tell people, my venture capital backing is my wife, who's a lawyer for the engineering firm. So <laughs> that's my VC support. When we looked at that sort of problem, that issue, and I actually wish I met you about eight years ago, um, one of, we funded a platform out of our back pocket at Allen Hancock Community College in Santa Maria, California. So all students from low income, low wealth background, four of them were crazy enough to sign up the first year. We went back to the school the second year and again, funded out of our back pocket. We were funding $15,000 for their last two years. They were all graduate, had, had, were completing community college we're going on, and we said, oh, okay, well, the second year we'll go back, we'll get a few more. And the second year we went back, we had 37 students apply, and we said, I don't have 15 times 37. We'll fund seven more. So we funded a total of 11 students, because every time we went to foundations, they said, well, come back to us with some results. So we got results, and we came back, and now they're telling us, go do another pilot bigger. Okay. And if we do another bigger pilot, we're going to ask for a then, and the response will be, we'll think of something. Um, I come from a background of corporate finance, where if you had a good idea, you could get funding very quickly. In the world of not-for-profits, they are very conservative. And the whole issue about helping students pay for college, it bifurcates very strangely, not on a political axis. It bifurcates from some people say the stupid question, oh, well, they should just borrow or they shouldn't go, or, well, I worked my way through. My oldest brother, the same guy, when I went to him and said, well, here's our idea, venture capital sort of model. He said, oh, and by the way, don't expect the schools to help you out. And I said, why is that? He said, they don't think it's their job. And that was dead on. We've now talked to probably the five biggest university systems in the United States, and everyone said, well, this is really interesting. But when you cut through the crap, we don't think it's our job. So we've talked to UC, we talked to Stanford, we talked to the City University of New York, we talked to the State University of New York. We're still talking to UMass Amherst. We're talking, other folks are talking to the Massachusetts State University system. We were advisors to Purdue's program. Purdue was the only one we've actually run into and they did it before we got to them that said, oh yeah, we got a foundation, we'll fund it out of the foundation. And we helped Purdue then place that debt in the capital markets. But you will hear this story going on which is very perplexing about how hard could this be? But it turns out it's much harder and much trickier than we thought. And I'll stop there. Perfect, yeah, um, great. So, and we're gonna follow up on a couple of these threads in a lot more detail. Um, but first, I think for some folks, um, I know when I started looking into this space, I wasn't as familiar. Um, and depending on your background or your own experience with um, taking out loans um, or, uh, or otherwise funding higher education, um, you may not be as familiar. So I'd love to help kind of set the stage for what what does financing look like now for um, the average student looking at, um, well, first a, a college degree and then perhaps some alternatives as well. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um, so I think when we're, just to, to give a landscape view of, of you know what financing in education looks like right now. As part of the report, we did a really big landscape review um, and came up with three different categories of um, financing options. Um, one is borrowing type models, um, one is employer paid models, and one is refund based models. Refund based models, I think, are, you know, coming out of the idea that, hey, if you can't get a job, we're gonna give you your money back, which sounds great, um, and it's a testament to quality. Um, the problem is a lot of people think of it as marketing gimmicks. Um, so it's, it's real effectiveness is, is, I don't know if it's necessarily clear. Um, in terms of employer reimbursement, um, we have the typical re employer reimbursement models and tuition support models that have been around for a very long time, but then there's also a lot of new partnerships, big partnerships between universities or colleges um, 
and a lot of different companies like the ASU Starbucks uh, partnership, um, where it's really about the employer thinking about their return on investment and how well they can really help um, improve their workforce. Um, and then the big one, aside from federal loans, I think that we're all fam um, familiar with are loans. Um, so you have private loans, um, you have new, newer types of private loans that we kind of call alt finance loans, which um, take into consideration other criteria besides your credit score. Um, and so this, the idea behind this is, I think, twofold. Um, one is that you, it, it gives you insights to the quality of programs because um, your, uh, it may be based, your rates may be based on how good that program is, how good it, how well it produces outcomes. Um, and then the other type um, is, is looking kind of backwards and focusing on access. And if, if you don't take into account credit score, would more people have access to education um, and, and not really be held back by the back, their back circumstances, their background um, and economic circumstances. Um, and, and I think as we were kind of evaluating all of these things, what rose to the top was income share agreements. Um, income share agreements, from our perspective at least, has a lot of um, opportunity to really reduce some of the major problems in education. Um, in particular, what we were looking at was access to financing and therefore access to education, um, program quality, whether or not has the, the ability to boost um, our knowledge about whether a program is worth its investment. Um, we also looked into how it would, um, how, um, I'm blanking now, um, how, how risk sharing would work, whether or not the university um, or the school is actually taking share in, in the risk of, of a education or a program not working out. Um, and then lastly, uh, how it influences the opportunity to innovate, innovate in education. And by that I mean, can we create new types of programs like boot camps that will help um, people that, that we can finance with new methods, especially um, in light of the fact that federal programs don't typically um, fund them. So that's kind of like my, my wide view of, of the landscape of options. Great, and, um, and let's get into, I know we have a couple different approaches, income share agreements, which we will define, um, are, are certainly one of them, um, but also loans and the wraparound services. Um, and we have folks here who are representing sort of the um, non-traditional education pathways as well as engaging more of the traditional pathways. So I'd love um, for uh, the others kind of on the panel to comment on, um, and maybe we'll start with you, um, Casey, and we'll, we'll toss kind of defining income share agreements your way and, um, and how you've kind of engaged, uh, yeah, basically give us the pitch. Why income <laughs> share agreements? Um, and how have you started to sort of build the landscape there? Um, and then uh, maybe, Sylvan, if you can add a little bit to around how you chose that as a model and how it's working out. Um, and then we'll snap back over to you, um, Jesse, to give us a little bit more info on um, why the approach via loans um, and how that's going. All right, so this is the quick tour of income share agreements. So the basic deal with our students in Santa Maria and Purdue looks a lot like this, and all the ISAs are variations of this theme, which is we give you, the student, a specified dollar amount of funding, either per year or <coughs> for a certain duration. In our case, it was 15000 In exchange for that, we tell you we're gonna, you're going to sign a contract where you promise to pay us 5% of your income for 15 years with a bunch of caveats embedded in it. The basic deal is <coughs> percent of your gross income as a function of what you're funded with. The first question you get is, what's the interest rate? The answer is there isn't one. Right? But we're all good Americans. We know about credit cards. So what you get embedded in that ISA, though, becomes, well, so what are the outs? Well, in our program, if you pay back four times what you were funded with, you're out. So even if you haven't gone through the full 15 years, and we were getting those are low income, low wealth students. One of our students was undocumented. So we have the whole interesting group of students. Um, he actually graduated from San Jose State, was doing well. Um, but the, but the idea was percentage of income, maybe it looked more like a venture capital model if you're familiar with that. The other out was we put a cap on the total return that we as investors could make, which in the case of Santa Maria was 0%. So once we get the capital back from the pool, the obligation for the pool ceases. And then the other option that was sort of embedded 
was the standard, because there's a bunch of contractual stuff here and it all matters, which was if the thing is thrown out in court or if you go bankrupt or any number of civil or bankruptcy actions happen, you're also out, which is not how student loans work in most U.S. So that's the basic framework of an ISA. Okay. And, um, and Sylvan, how about your approach? I mean, um, yes. how did you guys kind of choose this model? It is something, as, um, as Amber observed, too, that's kind of trending um, among alternative uh, models for higher ed or training. So I would love to hear a little bit about your experience. Yeah, so we are on the other side of the spectrum uh, compared to, to Casey. We, we are the school part. And so the way our ISA model works is that there is no, so no upfront tuition um, before or during the school. And uh, the deal is a uh, percentage of your salary uh, once you get a job, if you get a job. Um, so we, we think that post-secondary education should get student ready for a job. So, and in this way, ISA works, right? If you, if you consider your post-secondary post education as something just not designed to get you a job, then it doesn't make sense. But that's what we believe. We believe that you come to Holberton to learn a craft and to thrive in your career. And so if you take this assumption, it makes a lot of sense to align the success of the students, um, the, the success of the school and the success of the students. So yet yeah, 17%. Once you get a job, if you get a job of your income for three years. And there is a threshold at 40,000. So if you make less than 40,000, then you, you don't pay anything. Um, so what's great is that students will never have to pay something if they have no job, and they will also contribute back proportionally to their success. So if they, if they have a great success, then they will um, pay, like, will, will have a great return on investment. If they have a low success, then then they don't reimburse us. And we have also a high threshold, so the maximum that they can pay is 85,000. So some of our students have like, like six digit plus <coughs> salary, like very high, and they would end up paying more than 85%, but we have this cap. Um, so yeah, I, like, like company-wise, it's kind of risky, because you're right, if you fail at your mission, you, you, we close the door, but I think, like, I think socially, I feel very good about that. And, and if we do a great job at educating our students, we'll thrive, otherwise we'll, we'll shut, shut down. How, how about you, Jesse? Um, in terms of the model, and obviously you have a really extensive background in sort of designing um, for a given sort of lower income population and thinking about this group, but um, can you explain a little bit more what's sort of innovative or new about uh, the Six Up model? Yeah. Um, I So, one of the things that is really hard with any group, but in particular a group that is unfamiliar with um, all the capital markets is just understanding and feeling comfortable with the types of agreements they're getting into. Income share agreements are hard for me as somebody who studied economics and business to understand. And that's been like, I mean, we were talking about this even before this panel, it's one of the first things that comes up always with income share agreements. Um, it doesn't mean it's not a cool space and interesting to explore, but it does mean it might take a while longer for it to actually be accepted and understood by, by people. And I, I think it's really, I want to do something now and do something now for, for students and also figure out other ways of pressuring um, these you know, traditional universities to change the way that they're operating without requiring the, their buy-in before producing a change. So for example, we, um, f as, a, as a private lender, we don't require a university to um, to you know get on board with anything necessarily. Like they they could add us to their preferred lender list or not, but you know they don't have to. Um, but we can take into account their outcomes into our underwriting. So we can choose not to fund students that go to schools that don't produce outcomes that they are that 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 schools have to report if they're um, receiving Title IV funding. So um, if school is not graduating students, if a school has really high federal default rates on federal loans, we cannot fund them. Or we can, you know, that's a huge factor that would go into our underwriting of what the interest rates and everything would be, which of course it is. And obviously, long term, we would think like we, we could have enough data to actually like really affect um, students before they go into school, like by showing and sharing data of like, is this school we're going to be worth taking out money for? Probably, like you know, probably not in some cases. Like you, it would be better for you to not take out any extra money and go there because your likelihood of positive outcomes is negligible. And 
um, or it might, it might be way better to go to like a two-year school or it might be way better to go to a, um, a cheaper four-year, like a state school that might be less expensive that produces the right outcomes for you. Um, that's why I'm like. That's why I'm excited about getting into uh, or doing the type of model that that we're doing, and I'm also excited about it because the I think the su support services are actually a really important addition um, onto the traditional lending model, um, especially when working with a port a portfolio of students that is really unlikely to be successful in higher education. They've never they don't. That, no, there's a lot of reasons for that, and we can talk about that if people are interested in it. But they are really unlikely to be successful, and they're really unlikely to pay back a loan according to a lot of other data. And so um, having a more hands-on approach, we, th we think we can actually change that and influence it. Yeah, it's fascinating to try to close the data loop and the feedback loop. Um, and I do want to get into that um, a little bit more. But first, and you kind of all touched a little bit on this, I want to open up um, some of the criticisms, right? Like, who is resistant to this? And when they resist to your given model, what do they say? So we heard from you know Casey like, oh, they just don't understand it, right? And Jesse too, where you're like, ISAs, people just don't kind of get what that is. There are other criticisms, and Amber, you probably encountered them in your research around, you know, this is indentured servitude. Um, <laughs> Sylvan, I'm curious too from your perspective around like when you if you know receive resistance from students or questions, what does that kind of typically look like, or what are those where do those come from? And and Jesse, to you too in terms of how you design and explain. A lot of these programs, I'd be curious to understand what are the questions or the criticisms that come up from your kind of users, um, as well as perhaps the others in the ecosystem. So, <laughs> Casey, you look really excited to share. <laughs> and I know you have a lot of experience in this space, so maybe we'll start with I'll you. Be brief. Um, we've been accused of indentured servitude, we've been accused of slavery, which is interesting. Um, we actually, one of the first people we talked to was actually Michael Horn, who was. <laughs> with your mm -hmm. organization, who was involved with the Christensen Institute at Harvard at the time. And we met with Michael, and Michael's initial response was, wow, this seems like pretty straightforward. This isn't a new idea at all. And the woman working with him was a Harvard Business School graduate who went on to McKinsey, who wrote the Harvard Business School case about us, said, oh, no, people are going to say this is slavery. And Bob and I were like, uh huh. Mm -hmm. And Michael Horn was like, no. <laughs> and the next day, an article in the New York Times came out that said, ISAs, are these slavery? And it's like, yes, okay, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> we have this one. Um, no, it doesn't go away. The other part, but generally applying to everything to do with finance, especially if you're focused on low income, low wealth, is no one, 17 and 18 year olds from those households, from those backgrounds, actually don't even know what debt is very well. I mean, there's really good polling data that says a third of them, when you ask them, so you borrow $10,000, how much are you going to have to pay back on a 10 year loan? A third of them will say $10,000. Some will say, oh, maybe less, or, oh, I, if I go bankrupt, I can walk away. I mean, just the level of financial innumeracy is sort of astonishing. And then you take it up with an ISA. And the other weird part we had, so we were doing low-income, low-wealth, trying to do it right. And the students actually got it pretty fast. Oh, percent of income, percent of this, good. The financial aid people never got it, so they would go crazy. But the parents of the students we were talking to were like, so these are four old white guys from Wall Street? Yeah, run. Run from them as fast as possible. There's a fear of financial technology throughout the whole financial aid sector. And, and to be fair, these communities have been ripped off by Wall Street. So there's nothing accidental about that. There's just lots of barriers you have to get over. So. I mean, I. Uh, I s m said that people don't understand ISAs. They don't understand loans, too, to your point. It's like, that's a lot of the criticism, is, you're, is we're getting young people into the debt that don't really understand what they're going to be taking out $60,000 or however much for um, over the course of their a fo of a traditional four-year college degree. Um, and that's a, that's a really f fair criticism. It's, it's hard. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, I think another another one is like for for us as an alternative in in terms of where we're positioned in the market, we do credit history is a piece of what we look at. It's not the only or yeah primary even primary factor, but we do look at credit history and so we do turn down students because of that. And um, a lot of 
users I've, I've gotten a lot of sad emails of just like we thought you were different like this is like I'm all I'm always turned down for this and and then there's in some cases it's for a very good reason in some cases it's for really terrible ones where it's you know somebody took like a parent a sibling and somebody took out something in their name a long time ago and it's now on their credit history and you know you can provide some coaching for that but in the end we have to adhere to well we choose to adhere to um, a certain underwriting model that does that is an agnostic to that um, and that's a criticism from people that like are looking for the totally alternative version, which I guess we're not in that sense. Um, yeah, I'd say those are probably the biggest ones. And then I think the other one is not being as aggr aggressive enough with universities. So like we, we still do fund universities that are probably overcharging their students and, um, and a lot of, I think, yeah, like people like really trying to disrupt higher education would say like that should just not happen. Like you shouldn't channel students to those schools. Um, actually, we don't receive negative <laughs> criticism. Like, <laughs> uh, like honestly, our students are very happy about the candidates are over. Like, oh, like when they discover this, they're like, "Whoa, is this real?" And you know, they are looking for kind of, is there something that I don't understand? And um, so, like, I have some students that are like, oh, students were so happy to be, I could never, have, like, done this because I, a lot of our students actually, they have, like, student loan. They are in, in debt, but they cannot find a job. One of our students, she was cashier at Trader Joe. She had a bachelor in art. She could not find anything better than cashier at Trader Joe. She could not reimburse her debt. And she came here. She went through the program, and after nine months, she got an offer. And she was like, Sylvain, can you come with me so that we can check the offer? And she entered the room, and as, as she was reading the offer, she was crying of, of joy, you know? And she was like, like we changed our life, and, and we really want to make this even bigger. So we partner with Neo. He's like a pop singer. Uh, he's not, not on the show World of Dance or something like this. And he's doing a great job at helping us to, um, I think one of the, the issues with ISA is like making people it and they don't know about this opportunity. So we want role model who can speak to uh, underrepresented people in the tech industry. And, and I think removing the tuition uh, fee by using ISA is a first step toward making high quality education accessible to the most. But the truth is, at least for Holberton, living in, in the San Francisco Bay Area is very expensive. And even, even though we remove the tuition fee, it's not in us. And there are a lot of uh, candidates who actually cannot come because they cannot afford to, li to live here. Um, so we need, at least for Alberton, to bring this to the next level, which is something we are working on. Uh, removing tuition is like one step, a huge step, and now we need to uh, tackle living expenses. And Amber, I don't know if you want to say anything. I'm, um, I know in the research of the report it covered sort of the uh, the indentured servitude or <laughs> slavery angle. I don't know if you want to take that on or highlight a couple yeah, of Yeah, no, I think that there's there's a lot of challenges from a lot of um, different angles. Um, I think just to add on to, to one that you were talking about, the underwriting um, models is, is, and I'm no expert in this by any means, but <laughs> um, question about you know whether considering new underwriting criteria whether or not the, it's ethical and whether or not it actually restricts or expands access um, to financial aid or to financing and, and to education for some people. So I think in, in, th in theory what they're saying is um, credit score is already used as a signal um, to help financiers decide whether or not somebody would be a good candidate for a loan. Um, in place of if we don't have the, the credit score, what is that next? Uh, point of data that we can all rally around and say, okay, this is equal and, and um, the right data to use for everybody across the board. Um. So let me throw out a, yeah. there's, a, there's a phrase that comes up in ISAs, it also comes up in what you're doing. Um, that was thrown at us a few years back and it stuck. What the person referred to as was digital redlining. The idea in the old days, mortgage companies would put red lines around neighborhoods that were primarily African American and not make loans into those markets. And it was literally, I mean, I used to work at one of those companies a long time ago, and there was a map that had a red line on it. And they're like, oh, we don't make loans in there. It's like, that's Oakland, that's where I grew up. We don't make loans there. In the world of digital underwriting, you can end up doing the same sort of 
redlining, discrimination, without ever having a data item that says race. And in fact, the flip side is, in this world of alternative education financing, is you can also end up, I mean, we, we actually, there's a group called Upstart that is still around, started out doing ISAs, who now have been doing what I call credit skimming. Don't mean to be pejorative, but that's sort of what it is. Um, when, when I started out there, uh, Jeff Keltner, who's their sort of chief numbers guy, sat down with him and I said, okay, so you came out of Google, you've got lots more data than I've got. If I ask for one data point that tells me what someone's going to make, what is it? He says, oh, we know that one, that's easy. The zip code of the parents, which is the zip code of the school they went to when they were growing up, that defines about 40% of what they're gonna make as a data item right off the bat. It has nothing to do with anything else. So you can dig a hole for yourself, and not that I'm, you know, I worked in for-profit land, I love for-profits, this is a not-for-profit. We actually discussed long and hard whether we'd be a for-profit. But you can end up using digital data tools to do redlining which says, oh, we just happened to identify the kids that went to Palo Alto, Atherton, San Jose, the private schools, Berkeley. You know, we just didn't end up funding any kids that grew up in Oakland. You can do it really easily. You can do it unintentionally. You can do it just by passing because we don't have the kind of mobility in this country we used to have. And we end up with a setup that without intending it, just trying to avoid risk in your portfolio, you can end up doing a discriminatory practice. And there's lots of law around it for credit. Everyone like me would insist that income share agreement is not a debt agreement, therefore it doesn't apply to us. And I will say that when I get dragged into court. But separate from that, the whole underwriting issue can end up not increasing mobility, it can end up reducing mobility. So this area of ed finance I think is fascinating, I like it a lot, but there's a bunch of real ugly tripwires here and you have to think really hard about it to avoid that. Yeah, that's great. I think, um, so we talked briefly and I wanna make sure we leave also time for questions, especially since we're a small group, um, we want this to be more of a conversation. Uh, but we've talked now about some of the barriers around trust, um, around responsibility, like whose job is this and different approaches there, around marketing and people kind of even understanding that this is an option potentially that exists out there, um, around a little bit around the regulatory environment and the fact that this is a very gray space. Um, and then uh, also the risk of, of bias and other things kind of creeping into um, these, these new tools. I wanna switch over now and we can return to a lot of these risks and challenges that I'm sure our audience will pick up on some of them as well. Um, but I wanna hear a little bit about bright spots. So Sylvan sort of mentioned one already with the student um, who was kind of overwhelmed with the opportunity. Um, I'm wondering uh, if we can share some of those bright spots, some of the promising um, things that we see happening. I'd love to mention and, and discuss a little bit more also the Purdue um, experiment for those that might be less um, familiar with it. And then also just open opportunities, maybe areas um, that you've encountered and said, huh, okay, like this is really interesting, more people should be working on this or doing this thing, um, or if I had a magic wand and could get a lot of smart people um, involved in this, this is where I'd focus their efforts. Um, so maybe we'll start, Amber, if you wanna kick us off. Yeah, sure, so I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I, as I mentioned kind of early on, ISA in particular, or you know, a lot of other alternate alternative financing options have the opportunity to improve access. They have the opportunity to improve program quality and to allow us to innovate in education and that's all great stuff and what we need to do. Um, and, and I think in particular what needs to happen um, is, is to, to your point, people have to talk about it and we have to talk transparently about it. Um, we have to get this kind of information, I think, into the hands of financial aid offices with people who can really understand it and talk at um, you know, really basic level to parents and students about what this means and what the alternatives are and picking what's right for you. Um, in, in being such an advocate for it, it doesn't mean, I'm, I'm not meaning to say that um, any of the other options are, are less good. They're still good options for students. They have to make that decision given their own circumstances. Um, and, and I think the, the point is to say that um, an opportunity here is really to empower students and empower parents and families to really like own the process of financing their education rather than just kind of defaulting to the government and then defaulting to private loans when all else fails. 
bright spots? Jesse, you're uh, I am, I have a lot, but I'll focus on one, which is I'm really excited about the type of um, longitudinal data that we can collect that can make huge difference for like across K through higher ed and, and beyond, honestly, into a career. So we, just to like unpack that a little bit, so we require to apply for our loan, which is an annual loan, we require you to send in your transcript information. So course level data, that's largely what our algorithms run on. Um, we also, as a lender, have access to credit history. So we can do, we do, can do a hard credit pull, a soft credit inquiry, um, and then throughout, once some student actually graduates, we can do those things as well as see em their like employment status from that. If you think about all of that data, so like semester by semester, even some because some students apply the semester level year by certainly year by year, and then into career, we have we'll be able to collect so much information about um, about these students, where they're going to school, what they're studying, where they came from, which high schools. Um, we went into the market with all through partner organizations, so a lot of our students come from um, groups that are really dedicated to low income, first generation college students. So it's all the government trio programs, it's the a lot of char charter school networks, so the KIPs, the Cristo Reyes, the Harmonies, the Yes Preps, a lot of nonprofits working with first generation low income students. This is, once the students leave, you know, leave KIPP at 12th grade, these, they try to stay in touch, but it's almost impossible. Um, but if their students are getting funded through us, then all of a sudden they have access to like this, you know, the next 15 years of that student's data. That's really exciting. I think that has, um, yeah, that makes me just, I, I, and I just think there could be so many more interesting things that we do on top of that besides just, of course, financing. Um, that's kind of what opens up the whole ed tech side of it, of kind of connecting data sets all together. Uh, actually, I'd want to add something. We speak a lot about data collection. And the way we work here is that we don't look at your professional or academical history. We don't look at your ethnicity, your age, your gender. We don't care about any of this. The only data that we collect is um, your capacities, your abilities. So we select based on three criteria, which is talent, um, ability to collaborate, and motivation. And so we we take the risk. Um, we pay for the education of our students for two years, right? So we pay for their education. And then because we are so confident in our application process and in the curriculum, then we, um, we know we, 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 we basically don't look where, where you are from, where, you know, where, what did you do, but we know that you'll do well and, and we know that like in some, you know, um, in some capacity our students will do well and, and, and will have the return on investment. So I think it, it's interesting to see the kind of like um, removing this bias on your past, but more looking at your capacity and opening, um, you know, ISA to people who could not have access to. Great, and before we go to questions, I do want to make sure we flag the Purdue pilot. Um, I think that's part of sort of having a proficiency or familiarity with the space. So, um, Casey, I know you've done a bunch of work um, in, in the space with that, and then Amber, if you have anything to add, but maybe if you want to kind of kick it off or at least introduce the setup. So, so <laughs> Purdue contacted us about, I guess it's almost three years ago now, um, and said they were thinking of doing an ISA program, would we come advise them? So they hired. 13th Avenue funding. If, you're, if you want to dig into this space, some other folks to think about. So Vimo Education is sort of trying to build the infrastructure pipes. So they're based in Virginia. They're, they are the actual servicer collection advising platform for the Purdue program. And the other advisor there was uh, the Jane Family Institute, which is a private foundation based in New York City. They have a sub-foundation they're sponsoring called <coughs> Better Futures Forward. Kevin James is the guy who runs that. Kevin was the associate on Capitol Hill who worked for the congressman from Wisconsin who wrote the first ISA bill. So you could pretty much get everybody who's doing ISAs very comfortable in this space. Um, and we've all, Tonio who started Vimo Education was our outside lawyer when he was an associate at Oric. So this is how incestuous this whole narrow little world of ISAs is. And it's a very tiny group. The, I forget the question you were asking. Um, <laughs> tell us about the pilot. <laughs> Purdue's university president is a guy named Mitch Daniels. He used to be the governor of Indiana. He read about ISAs, thought this was a good idea, and said, let's go do it. Um, there was an interesting education program because 
we got hired and we said we sat down with Philip Purdue and said, okay, what do the students say? And they all looked at each other and said, well, we haven't talked to them. This is just a financing issue. So we had a meeting with students, and of course the shit hit the fan. Because <laughs> and they had never met, and they were like, people seem to get this is just fine. It's like, no, this is about emotion. This is about you're asking for a piece of my income for how many 